When Ronald Reagan was governor of uh, California, he used to love to tell the story of being in Mexico to deliver a speech. He recalls being gravely disappointed with the lack of enthusiasm in the crowd. Finally, after he was seated and felt rather defeated, a gentleman rose to his feet and went to the podium and began speaking to the crowd Spanish, to which the audience erupted in thunderous applause uh, at regular intervals throughout his speech. And so Mr. Reagan decided it was time to start joining the applause, and he would applaud to encourage his comrade till finally one of his aides leaned over and said, Mr. Reagan, you might want to stop doing that. He's translating your speech. Lo and behold, many of us like to applaud ourselves, don't we? But the Bible has a clear message that we need a 180 in our attitude toward ourself. And I can prove it to you in Luke chapter 18. Come with me to one of the famous parables of Jesus. In Luke chapter 18, I want to talk to you this morning about two men who offered two prayers, who had two divergent views of self, and thus two different kinds of approaches to God, and only one of them, according to Jesus, was justified. Two men, two prayers, two views of self, two approaches to God, and only one of them, in the words of Jesus, was justified in the eyes of God. So Luke chapter 18, you're familiar with this parable. And as always, I need to remind you that when I read the Word of God, we are placing ourselves under its authority. We are saying that this book is breathed out by God, and it is His authority and rule in our lives. And we, like David would say, oh, how we love your law. It is sweeter to my taste than honey. So Jesus taught in Luke chapter 18. Watch this now. Verse number 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Tax collectors were deeply despised by the Jews in the first century. In fact, they were considered nothing more than an animal. They were outcasts. They were not welcome at the temple. They were rejected by the people, by and large, because of their collecting taxes for the Romans. And they were, con- they were considered a corrupt lot of men. So one was a religious leader, the Pharisee, steeped in the law. And then a, re- a man who had been rejected. Watch this. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give all that I get, or I tithe of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest saying, God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house. Here's one of the greatest words in all the Bible, justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So this text introduces us to the right attitude we should have toward ourselves. Let me show you, first of all, in this text, our greatest problem in verse 9 is self-reliance. Our greatest problem is self-reliance. Jesus said, here's a man who trusted in himself. One of the greatest idols in our lives 
is the idol of self. We're trusting in ourselves. We're all cursed with this idol. That's why Jeremiah said, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength and turns away from the heart of the Lord. Cursed is the one who puts his trust in mankind. So self-reliance is the problem, isn't it? So sinners will rely on self and never be saved. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, here's a Pharisee who trusted in himself, you will never see the kingdom of God. So if you lean on yourself for eternal life, you're damned. You're going to hell. You won't make it to heaven. But lo and behold, trusting in ourselves doesn't always stop for the Christian. We can come humbly to receive God's grace and the gift of salvation and continue to struggle with trusting ourselves. You know how you trust yourself? You worry too much. Every time you worry, you're trusting in yourself. Every time you fear the future, you're trusting in yourself. The Apostle Paul actually gave testimony in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and said, we went through great trials of affliction in Asia Minor for preaching the gospel there, so much so that we felt like we had received the sentence of death. Then he went on to explain, but all this happened so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in the Lord. This is Paul. The mighty apostle saying the need you have is to stop trusting in yourself. If anybody had the right to trust in himself, man, this guy was planting churches, preaching the gospel. He was crisscrossing the globe for the message of Christ. But his testimony was the same as Jeremiah's. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Now notice the evidence. How do you know that you're trusting in yourself? This text says you have contempt for others. Contempt for others is an indication that you've made yourself an idol. And you are the god of your own destiny. You think you're superior to others. The word contempt here means disdain. To feel justified in treating somebody else with disrespect and even disgust. Do you know how much that has infiltrated our culture? Nations and cultures and races and human beings everywhere have certain people that they hold in contempt. Jesus says, you have contempt for others because you're trusting in yourself. You have not moved your confidence to the heart of Jesus Christ because of course he teaches us to treat everybody with the love and respect that he himself would have as he walked the earth. Had a wonderful conversation this past week with our potential church planter over in uh, Lebanon. We Skype once in a while, and uh, I I asked him, how can I be praying for you in the ministry that you have? And uh, he began sharing some of his testimony with me, including that he's discovered he cannot minister among the Muslims where he is preaching the gospel and planting churches, if he doesn't first and foremost know before God that he loves them as Jesus commanded him to. And I said, oh, how soon can you come to Canada? And teach us to love Muslims as you do. And teach us to love our neighbors as Christ taught us to so that we can reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we can love them as God has commanded us. Our greatest problem is self-reliance. Our greatest danger is self-righteousness. That's in verse number 10. So he told them this parable for those who trusted themselves, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray. They both were seeking to establish their righteousness, weren't they? That's the reason verse 10 explains they were going up to the temple. So the greatest danger is self-righteousness. It's almost scandalous to some people to realize that there are various motives at work in church on the average Sunday morning. Not everybody came here to worship God out of a pure heart. Not all of you who are sitting in this audience this morning came for the right reasons. 
Some of you came to establish your own righteousness. If this text is true, Jesus said, there were two men who went to the temple. One was trusting in himself. One was seeking to be forgiven by God. And so one was suffering from the malady of self-righteousness. So don't be scandalized. I've learned through the years not to be surprised, as Jesus said, when the wheat grows up with the tares. And many who say they are Christians never behave like it because they are not Christians, but they are members of the church. They've been baptized. They belong to the church. But Jesus is making it clear in this text that not everybody who goes up to the temple to pray has come with a pure heart to meet God. So what is the answer when we grow frustrated with the church? Anybody listening to me this morning? Or am I off on a tangent? Because sooner or later, the church will frustrate you. The church will disappoint you. You'll see every imaginable motivation at work in the church. So what is the answer? The answer is, I'm responsible for me. And you are responsible for you. And you need to get your eyes off others. And the reason you come to church isn't to examine and judge and determine where everybody else is spiritually. You come to say to God, be merciful to me. I need your grace. I need your fresh love and power in my life. And so the greatest problem is self-reliance. The greatest danger is self-righteousness. And the greatest enemy in verses 11 and 12 is pride. Religious pride in particular, according to this text. Being proud of our religious accomplishments and of what we've been able to achieve on our own. Just notice a couple of things about this Pharisee who prayed in the temple along with the tax collector. He's proud of his independence. He's positioned to this text as alone and self-supporting, but still, he's not too far away that others can watch what he's doing because he refers to seeing the tax collector and demeans him in his conversation with God. But he's aloof, he's independent. He's proud of the fact that he has made something of himself through his acts of religious activity. This ought to scare the living daylights out of every one of you who say you are Christians. Be careful to take the time to examine yourself, that you are not proud of your accomplishments, your religious accomplishments in particular, but any accomplishment for that matter. Do you not see it as a gift from God? Do you not see the blessings in your life as the grace of God? Not because you deserve it and you've earned it, but simply because God in his kindness had showered amazing blessings upon your life. So this man was proud of his independence. He's proud of his piety, his religiosity. God, I thank you, he says. Isn't it interesting that Jesus said, two men went up to the temple to pray, but this isn't a prayer, this is a speech. And don't forget that Isaiah said of God's house, the temple, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But prayer is not impressing God with your accomplishments. Prayer is humbling myself and calling out to him for the strength I need to be what he has called me to be. He appears to have made God his debtor, don't you think, the way that you read this text? So he's proud of his independence. He's proud of his piety. God, I thank you. He wasn't thanking God. He was congratulating himself. See how easy it happens? I personally don't think there's anything more seductive and dangerous than spirituality when it meets the proud heart of a human being. There are none so hard to reach as the religious. There are none so hardened in their sin and blindness as those who grew up in the shadow of the church memorizing the Bible, knowing the Ten Commandments, even boasting that they have lived by them. There's a kind of hardness. There's a shell that settles over the hearts of those who sit under the ministry even of God's amazing grace. 
I remember being on a trip down south the United States, stopping at various communities, and we usually will stop at, uh, at uh, the uh, uh, Cracker Barrel because you can get a good meal and do a little shopping, stretch your legs. And I always like to sit on the rocking chairs out front. And lo and behold, somebody would come and sit down beside you. And at some point in conversation, I like to say, are you a Christian? <laughs> to which you will hear more than any other time. I'm a Baptist. I was raised a Baptist. To which I'll say, I didn't ask you your denomination. I asked you about your relationship with Jesus. Because there are Presbyterians and Methodists. And on and on I could go who know Jesus who aren't Baptists. So be very careful about it. Yeah, I'm preaching to you, church family. You're in great danger of trusting in yourself and establishing your own piety and your own strength. Notice the perceived moral superiority. I thank you that I am not like other men. <laughs> wow, it, dripping with disdain for others. I haven't committed adultery. I haven't extorted unjust taxes out of others, forgetting about all the other laws of God that he has broken in his life, but having a short list of the ones in which he prides himself. Do you know what God would do as a favor to this man? Let him trip. I'm not suggesting that God tempts anyone with evil, because he doesn't. But sometimes the best thing that can happen to you is that you fall flat on your face in the area where you are most proud of yourself so that God can reach down into your proud heart and finally bring you to the place where you need him and only him. Can you imagine saying to God, thank you that I'm not like other men. You can just see his chest swelling, can't you? As he cocks his head back and sticks his nose in the air at everybody else. Jesus makes it very clear, this man wasn't justified. He was lost. He's proud of his religious works. I fast and I tithe. By the way, there's nothing wrong with fasting and tithing. Every Christian should do it. The church has lost the discipline of, 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 of fasting. You should research and fast at least once a week, if only a partial fast. You should accentuate your hunger for God and your discipline of your body to hear from the Lord by saying, I'm going to skip a meal or two today. You'll be absolutely amazed. Jesus isn't saying there's anything wrong with fasting. He fasted. There's nothing wrong with giving. The Christian that doesn't give does not have the heart of Jesus. And I'm talking about your financial giving. If you are not a giving Christian, you are not an obedient Christian. But this man made that religious activity the tipping of his hat, congratulated himself, and hid behind his good works. So Charles Spurgeon put it this way, don't be proud of race, face, place, or grace, because it is all of God's grace in your life, right? So... Our greatest problem is self-reliance. Our greatest danger is self-righteousness. Our greatest enemy is pride. Our greatest need is humility. And of course, humility is outlined in the life of the tax collector, the despised outcast tax collector. Notice how he is the exact opposite of the Pharisee. He was humble in his presence. The Bible says he stood afar off. Why did he do that? I think he probably, in a practical way, he wanted to distance himself from the Pharisee. I don't know. Uh, maybe, I, what I do know is that his posture demonstrated that he knew his sin had separated him from God. And his distance from God is a testimony that I realize my sin has, sep I take responsibility for my sin because it has separated me from you. So he's humble in his presence. He's humble in his approach to God. He would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, bowed his head in humility before the Lord. Hey, once in a while, I love to lay on the back lawn and stare way up at the sky and talk to God. It's, it's not the posture in prayer that matters. It's the attitude of the heart that counts. But this man 
was feeling the burden of his sin as he went to pray, so much so that he would not lift up his eyes to heaven. Listen carefully. He didn't feel the privilege of religion. And he didn't suffer from a sense of entitlement. You listening to me, church family, do you know how poisoned we have become as a society with a sense of entitlement? Everybody owes me. Canada owes me. My family owes me. The church owes me. Furthermore, God is in my debt. He owes me. This man did not have a sense of entitlement. Pity the poor church when members in the church feel that they have it's their church. Pity the poor church when the pastor thinks it's his church. Pity the poor church when the elders and deacons claim it as their church. It's God's, and we are only stewards of his. And it doesn't matter if you've been here 30 years or three minutes. You are as welcome here and as blessed here and as honored here as anyone else. There are no classes in the church no one has earned any greater status than anyone else in the body of Christ. He's humble and he's grieving his sin. Notice what he does. He beats his chest. Why do you suppose he did that? It's interesting, by the way. I think it's uh, in Jeremiah 31, he's detailing uh, Ephraim's repentance. And Ephraim was uh, slamming his fist against his thigh in repentance against God. So it's a biblical picture. It's feeling such grief over the mess that my sin has made to my own heart and soul that all I can do is respond with beating my chest. I think there's another reason he did it, though, because in the center of his chest is the little ticker we call the heart. And I think he's saying, the heart of my problem is in here. Not, not the organ that was pumping the blood in his chest, but the spiritual heart, because he recognized, I, I have a desire to know God, but my heart keeps getting in the way. I need a new heart. I need to be purified in heart. Second Samuel 24 details the story of David, the king disobeying God as a show of military strength. David censored the people numbered the people, and God told him not to do that, but to trust in him. The moment that David realized what he did, the Bible says, his heart struck him, and he wept in tears and repented before God because he had a tender heart. This man is humble in asking for mercy. You know, you have to humble yourself to ask for help. Are you willing to ask somebody else for help when you know they can give it and you need it from them? Amazing how independent we have become that it seems beneath us to say to somebody else, hey, can you help me out? How tragic then when God is the source of what we need and we won't trust him, we won't ask him. Notice that he admits the truth about himself. What does he say? All self-defense is gone, all blaming others is out the window, and he calls himself a sinner. He, he admits what the Pharisee was saying about him. And he admitted it honestly before God. I'm a rebel to the core. I'm a transgressor at heart. I'm running from God and I desire to do my own thing. This man is just being honest about his battle with his, his personal sin. You say, isn't this an unusual confession in the New Testament? Not in the least. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, Paul called himself the least of the apostles, unworthy to be an apostle. Paul lived with a continual sense that this great calling and privilege from God was a gift. He hadn't earned it. In fact, he looked back in Philippians and said, all that I gained in my training as a Pharisee, I consider that as, forgive me, a heap of dung that I might gain Christ. He wasn't trusting in his education, his religious accomplishments, but in Christ and in Christ alone. And so Paul said he's the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he calls himself the least of all the saints. My favorite is in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where we're told that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. How great is that? 
That's good news for this tax collector. But then Paul says, I'm the chief of sinners. I've determined, Corinne, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have an argument with the Apostle Paul. Say, you weren't the chief. I am the chief sinner. By then it'll be all over, right? This is the kind of humility that God is trying to call us to experience in our lives. Remember the famous story of the two um, religious leaders in the late 1700s, George Whitfield and John Wesley. They would often have serious theological disagreements. One day somebody said to Mr. Whitfield, Mr. Whitfield, do you believe that you'll see John Wesley in heaven? To which Mr. Whitfield said, no! I believe that he will be so close to the throne of God and we who follow his teaching so far that we will not be able to catch a glimpse of him. That's the humility we need in today's world, don't we? Every time you fire up Twitter, Facebook, one religious leader is slamming the other religious leader. And they're splitting hairs continually over various models of theology rather than having the heart of John Westfield and uh, George Whitfield and John Wesley, who for the sake of the gospel would never publicly demean one another. They would challenge each other in their theology. They had divergent views on various biblical matters, but in public they would always speak well of their brother in Christ. That's the kind of humility that we need in the church. Let me just show you, lastly, fifthly, our greatest hope is justification. It comes in verse number 14. Jesus, having observed these two worshipers in the temple, says, I tell you, the man who humbled himself is the one who will be justified. It ought to be your favorite word in all the Bible because you know that God delights to justify sinners and to forgive sinning saints, right? The reason that humility and repentance is necessary is that God has made Repentance and faith. You listen and say, we're listening, Derek. God has made repentance and faith a re- prerequisite to being justified. You can't miss that. God delights to justify sinners, but he will not override your choice. He's waiting for you to come in repentance and faith. Turn from your self-righteousness and your stubborn independence of God and put your hope in Christ. So how does God justify us? You already know the answer to that, don't you? God justifies us on the basis of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ alone. The only hope of my sins ever being forgiven is that Christ died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Don't get drawn into the silly arguments that are going around about various models of atonement. Stay fixed on the teaching of the scriptures. Christ took your place, the one who was not guilty for the one who was guilty. He was punished under the wrath of God in your place. It is called the penal substitutionary atonement. The Bible teaches it. And it's the only means of salvation. But it's not a universal salvation. God is waiting for those who will come to him in repentance and faith and humble themselves before him. Do you remember Jesus healing the paralyzed man when his friends brought him to Jesus? They couldn't get close enough. They ripped the roof off the, the, the hut, the home, dropped him down, and Jesus said, because of your friend's faith, uh, go and sin no more. The scribes listening said... Who can forgive sins but God alone? They were right. Jesus is claiming I forgive his sins because I am God. And again I say, if he can forgive sins, how does he forgive us? Because he took our place at the cross. He paid the penalty of our sins. So Jesus makes application of the story and simply says, the one who humbles himself will be justified. And in being justified, you are exalted to the highest place. The one who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who says to Jesus, no, will be humbled. Rejected, ultimately, from the presence of God. But the one who humbles themselves, what, is he talk, what humility is he talking about? The humility he's talking about is, Lord Jesus, I'm trusting 
in you alone. You are the only one who I can appeal to for the forgiveness of my sins. You are the only one I trust. I'm exercising faith in you. That's what it means to humble yourself. And what does he do? He does two things. He removes your guilt. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You are forgiven forever. But there's a second thing that God does when you humble yourself before him to receive his gift of salvation. He exalts you to the highest heaven. What I mean by that is Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that we have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we who are far from God, we who are rebels to the core, who humble ourselves, are now seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And so when I humble myself, he justifies me, and in justifying me, he gives me the privilege of sonship. And that's where adoption comes in. Adoption is the right and privilege of a fully matured son of God. All the rights and privileges of being a Christian are mine because God recognizes the humility that he calls us to exercise in our lives. So the question is really simple. Have you humbled yourself to Christ? Have you admitted to God that you are a sinner? Have you called out to him? Lord, have mercy on me. To which he delights in saying, I forgive you. And I place you in my son. If you haven't done that, today is the day of salvation. Pray that prayer now. Become a part of the family of God. Humble yourself so that he can exalt you. Let's pray together and then we'll prepare to share the Lord's table together. Thank you above all things for the one who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore you, Lord, have highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. Now teach us to take our place at his feet, to bow hum humbly before him, to receive that great gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of sin and that new life, that abundant life that only he can give. May your blessing be upon your people today. For those that have not yet trusted Christ, I ask that you would draw them to yourself by the power of your Holy Spirit. May they humble themselves and be saved on this wonderful Canada Day, on this Lord's Day, on this Sunday. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.